Namaste, my dear brothers and sisters. The love and blessings of the mother in Sri to all of you from Sri Ashram Delhi branch. Today's session is uh, a conversation between two psychologists. Two psychologists with a difference. One of whom you heard last week in conversation with me, Janvi Pandya, who is again with us. Uh, we'll be playing her recording, but she has also joined us live from the US. And uh, the other psychologist I'm talking about is uh, Aditi Kaul, whom also you are all familiar with uh, because of uh, her participation in all RES programs. Uh, but uh, to tell you a little bit about her, she uh, finished her doctorate in psychology uh, around the year 2016. And uh, immediately after that, she discovered that uh, there was a course on Indian psychology at uh, Pondicherry being conducted by the Indian Psychology Institute there. This is something that uh, she had not come across uh, throughout her studies uh, in psychology in the university in India. And uh, this fascinated her and she registered for that course and it turned out to be a turning point in her life. After she has not looked back and uh, that course was based primarily on the integral psychology of Sri and the mother. And, uh, during these last six years, she has been delving deep into their works, as well as uh, trying to see how uh, this can be used as a foundation for guiding our lives. Instead of looking at psychology just as a subject of academic study, she looks at something, uh, looks at it as something that can uh, find an important place in our life and help us uh, live more meaningful lives. And she's also seeing, trying to look at how this knowledge of uh, the integral way of looking at the person can be used in the field of education. So we have these two psychologists who are, as you can see, psychologists, not the run of the mill psychologists, but psychologists with a difference in conversation with each other, trying to exchange notes. And uh, then after the session is over, they'll be both available for uh, answering any questions that you might have. Namaste. Welcome everybody to yet another session of Yes Dialogues. Today we have with us a budding psychologist, Ms. Janvi. She has completed her bachelor's and master's from India and she's currently doing her PhD from the US. She'll be talking to us about her own experience of studying psychology in India and studying psychology in the US. And as our conversation goes forward, we'll be discussing what is the current status of psychology as an academic discipline in India, how people live, actual psychology in India and how can we see the Indian perspective, the Western perspective, all of those things of psychology. So we'll kind of engage ourselves in that dialogue and hope you get something out of our exchange today. So thank you, Janvi, for joining us. Thank you so much. for having me. So I would just like to begin with uh, asking you if you can just very briefly share your journey of studying psychology in India and uh, then choosing to go abroad and do like your PhD. Mm -hmm. So how does that transition has been for you? And uh, what would you like to share with us? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think the uh, part of studying here itself was uh, um, a challenge because uh, when I was in 10th, and I decided that I want to do in fact, I decided that I wanted to do arts when I was in the eighth grade. And uh, my teachers are like, you know, this is or a lot of people in society also, that oh you can do a lot you know better why do you want to do arts um, so that was but I had the support of my family and they were like no you do what you feel is best for you so that 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 was the first challenge was to leave science and commerce especially science and then do arts uh, once that was done um, so I, I took psychology in 11th and 12th grade uh, after which I did my bachelor's in psychology um, and then masters in counseling psychology and then i decided to do a phd because i wanted to at first i just wanted to be a psychologist and uh, counsel people but then i realized that i can be more than just counseling and i was interested in that that is called the field of psychology as a researcher too along with uh, 
so that's that's when i decided that i want to do uh, counseling uh, psychology a phd in counseling psychology and dr ramesh vishani played a very important role in helping me um find myself and know what i truly wanted to do uh, the transition has been amazing there are i see so many contrasts and i think that's a privilege because being an outsider not born and raised and i'm one of the only people over there who are i mean who's come directly for a phd because generally international students go for a masters or bachelors before and so their background is more in america so i feel like it's a privilege to have that perspective of being outside of the system and the things that i notice and the questions that i ask people were like oh i didn't even notice that that was something to be asked so uh, it's a wonderful journey so far and especially from the lens of academics like uh, in our own experience when we have studied psychology in say universities mm -hmm. there's a lot of emphasis on uh, what to do but there's often missing of how to do it so uh, we often come across uh, students maybe who are in their bachelors or masters they know that okay i wanted to study psychology mm -hmm. like you shared very enthusiastically they enter college but then when they are nearing finishing the course and they don't know what next so how can one structure or find that structure in how to apply that in say the practical life or how to go about in the way of professionalism so if you can share that yeah, that's a wonderful question because uh, i do notice and a lot of batchmates that i had classmates that i had you know everybody wants i'm saying everybody but like those people that i'm talking about they do want to get into the field but even after getting a degree you feel like now what do i do how do i do it um which i think was a little different uh, structurally in, in america that i noticed is because in my first year itself i've just finished my first year and we learned about ethics as a specific course it was a full course which was never a course throughout my um journey from bachelor to masters here where we learn about your conduct what is the right thing to do what is the wrong thing to do um in in india we did learn about it but briefly we were not that was not the sole thing and we were not expected to write a paper on ethical dile dilemmas we did not discuss that what would what would you do in a situation like this or like that and especially in america obviously that's um, also very important because uh, the whole structure where people can people have the rights to actually question you sue you so they need that um, uh, more like a lot of focus on that but here also i feel like knowing what exactly would you do if you were in a situation where there are dilemmas like law is asking you to disclose client information but i think you cannot what do you do in a situation like that um i think that was a little missing another subject that we studied about was counseling psychology and corruption where we did learn in 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 india also i think was very similar where we learned uh, micro skills but what i noticed there was the stark differences that i noticed in the same course that i took in india and here was that in india it was very theory heavy so we i learned a lot of technical stuff what are the micro counsel, micro counseling skills we learned very much in detail of all of those things and and then we are supposed to by heart it right <laughs> for an exam so we know and and i'm not complaining against anything i'm just saying that it was wonderful to know that because there i felt very confident about knowing the skills but here in america maybe theory i mean those maybe you might not focus so much on the lecture of the professor teaching and student receiving and learning and then producing it in paper rather it is discussion based so maybe there might be less amount of information that you'd grasp but more amount of discussion and questions is what is it that you feel, what is that you want and so those those were the differences that here in america even though people have joined in directly for a phd program having no background in psychology for bachelor's or masters but there is like a way there is a clear structure of what you do as a professional and as a person in this field so by the time by the end of four years and at the same time you're doing practical so you are applying all of this knowledge um and at least for most students if you come directly from second year itself you start doing a practical which is in fact very scary because <laughs> you're like okay now you go and go out there and start counseling students but again um it helps you apply and integrate those things which i felt was a little missing here because you only do practical right towards the end of your masters which is again no doubt not very different in america but at least there is like more of discussion and questions and 
asking students what is it that you want um, more more of that and here it's more so both both has its own advantages but i think integration of both would be this one as well so in that sense what will you suggest to say students who are just completing their bachelors and looking for masters or students who are just say they have opted for counseling in masters and there's often a lot of confusion between clinical and counseling for students they often confuse especially in india they are not so much set in terms from a student's perspective so any clarity of if i'm a psychology student who wants to know because everybody may not want to or have that space to go to say us for doing a phd so how do they carve their path in india and get have that space to practice it so what are your thoughts on that how one can go about that's a great question in fact clinical the differences in different streams of psychology i mean i'm really surprised because i thought that i was the only one who didn't understand these things but it's a common lived experience of every person and that's why i had also you know i met a girl in clinical uh, was a friend of mine and i said tell me what exactly you do and then we decided to make a video just to show what is the difference because so many people end up doing clinical and then they realize that we can't practice um it's clinical the word sounds like <laughs> practice but then you need mphil and then and then it's like more hospital based and um so i think finding that out like there are basic differences firstly structurally there are lots of things out there which are not very clearly given um so knowing at least the basics like very few colleges offer a masters in counseling uh without a bachelors in psychology at all which is very new again this was not existing literally 5 years ago it was not there so now new colleges are coming up with those kinds of options so knowing what are your requirements um unfortunately our system wants us to know it way in advance and if you've missed that train they like okay now just you can't do it which is a very 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 big problem i think we miss out on a lot of good counselors for that but i think there are still other ways to get it done like having a phd like you know opens a lot of other doors so i think asking people knowing and knowing what you truly want not just going with the name that sounds cool or like the name that sounds <laughs> leading to a certain direction if you want to interact with people on focus more on counseling do counseling uh, if you're more interested in uh, just working in the hospital or under someone or working with a specific group of population maybe autism or then maybe clinical is useful if you want to work in the industry like work in a corporate then industrial may be useful but again industrial not very clear i realistically counseling has the maximum amount of jobs counseling psychology you can work in the corporate you can work in private practice you can work in schools you can even work in hospitals so yeah i think that is what uh, comes out of your sharing also no we synonymously use psychology as counseling mm -hmm. so it's that undertone of helping so if i'm sitting across the table with somebody and i'm trying to give them a perspective or just kind of being there holding space that has a larger connotation to then say dividing it to a clinical setup or an ob setup or something like that mm -hmm. and also what i understood from you is uh, a lot of initial clarity from a student's perspective will help so it's not that we don't have that uh, guidelines is that we just don't know what to look for mm -hmm. and also we are often dependent on the system to tell us that please tell us what to do Yeah. And in today's world of technology, I think if we get our research at the right time, like in the beginning, say the moment I chose that, okay, I want to study psychology. By the time I finish my degree, I'll be in a much clearer picture of where to do it, what to do it, how to do it. So that kind of uh, clarity is, I think, something which can be established. But having said that, uh, one word which I picked up from uh, your sharing is the word structure. Mm -hmm. and i think uh, that is also when you're looking at from the psychology perspective uh, even from say the mind understands structure so much and it's also out there something very very tangible mm -hmm. that okay this is which is initially required for clarity but i often also find that too much giving into structure can also kind of we can get lost in what i want so that can also be very very overwhelming at some point that somewhere we have to find that balance that there's a structure out there which i can approach mm -hmm. but before approaching that structure i need to have the clarity of how to approach it otherwise i will just say copy someone's else structure and then get lost and wonder that what did i go wrong mm -hmm. so that is also i think uh, one way of looking at and in fact that is where i feel uh, this whole uh, concept of east and west in psychology you know that mm -hmm. comes in 
that uh, even like for example my own experience and exploration has been uh, the indian perspective of psychology mm -hmm. and i did study like my masters and phd in the western psychology predominantly doing ob and trying to understand the whole corporate structure of how people work and very early into that setup when i realized that people are not just what they do they are much more than just their actions and uh, that is a limitation i felt that uh, the structural perspective or the western perspective was too much focusing on the behavioral aspect and kind of giving that sense of say categorizing people that this is this type of personality this is that type of personality mm -hmm. and in my own experience i quite felt restricted mm -hmm. i was like that can just be a part of my personality or the part of who i am but not the complete me yeah so like those idea of categorization that idea of labeling has a merit to it it's not that it's completely waste but putting all your money on that that this is who you are i think that also kind of creates a discord yeah. and i'm sure in your own uh, counseling uh, sessions when people come with certain problems the first fundamental issue is that that problem is the part of their life that's not their life so that subtle distinction of you know kind of getting that sense of separation from your action and that separation of action i find very very evidently being mentioned in the indian perspective of psychology mm -hmm. and it's very sad to know that in the academic settings we don't speak so much about indian psychology mm -hmm. and because it is so subtle and so say behind the scene mm -hmm. it's often missed and we take it for granted especially coming from say the indian perspective that this is very normal it's like uh, this is very basic Th these things we talk off the ground not like on the ground so that stark difference i think is another reason why psychology has not really picked up in a more way because end of the day we are dealing with people and people are not just their actions so what is your thought or what is your experience around this i love that perspective in fact i enjoy this conversation a lot is i completely agree with structure i feel like too much structure also kills creativity so that is one thing that i loved about the uh, work that i did here and uh, as a practicing student in my masters in india was i felt like even though i was a student there was more scope for creativity and bringing in um, not like it's not there uh, abroad but i felt like there right from the first year itself in my first practicum class where we discuss cases uh, i notice a lot of people and this is not universally everywhere else but at least specific to my my experience um in my university was people would be like yeah according to my theoretical orientation uh this and you know according to uh, just all it's like this yeah but according to existentialists like this yeah but in feminists it's like this so it was very structured and for me whenever i used to discuss clients in india or even there i never used like oh as per act you know it's supposed to be like this as per cbt it has to be because for me it was learning and that was the i think a gift from the indian um, education system is that we had to learn all the theories so, so and then they taught us to transcend beyond the theory so these are the theories because now we know that these theories are a lot of those theories are made in the west not applicable here so now you need to you need to first be very good and maybe you can pick one theoretical orientation that you study in depth and that you stick with but again there's lack of creativity but again uh, like you said um, that was a big big um, question that i also had because when i was here i never had to diagnose a thing um, that was not the expectation you can say that yeah maybe this is you know looks like bpd borderline personality disorder or maybe this does look like schizotypal personality disorder but we didn't have like a computer system where we entered it there it's like the first thing was like give a diagnosis to this person and i would be like you know even the uh, approach that i identify the most with i like a lot is acceptance and commitment therapy where also they are not very diagnosis focused because they say that describing behavior does not help solve it or work with it sure. right so um but that is but then again that's a structural thing over there in america everything is based on insurance so you can't actually pay for therapy out of pocket so you have to prove to the insurance that this person has a psychological problem for which you have to give them diagnosis which is why there is such strong issues with labels 
and sometimes i wouldn't understand some discussions that they would have about um and that later on like why diagnosis why is it so important and then later on i found out that you know there are so many ethics questions around ethics in diagnosis is because you know with racism certain certain set of people were diagnosed more say with conduct disorder you know that this person has antisocial personal personality disorder so that those are again like a structural issue with um with uh, insurance you don't have that sort of freedom uh, mm -hmm. where you don't like here i would not prefer diagnosing people or putting like a label on people even if i used the dsm as a very important guide to understand what's going on so that is true but again it's a system systemic thing for that you know if insurance companies yeah. change that's how it will change but because it's over there it's immediately like applied over here that it has to be like a diagnosis in india also in a lot of cases we feel like yeah that is like um, well, that's another thing which comes up what you shared no so another limitation which we have is that we are always looking say for the either or perspective that either it has to be like this or it has to be like this mm -hmm. so if i'm labeling and then we have to also get that labeling of right and wrong so is labeling right or is labeling wrong so we are labeling the label also so <laughs> that's the kind of meta yeah. thing which we do and because psychology in india is predominantly west dominated especially by in academia yeah. we try and uh, take that what is being done so like you mentioned dsm that yes this is being followed mm -hmm. but is it required in say the indian setting or what are the consequences in the indian setting that i feel can be a, left a little open okay. and also it, this brings me to another question that uh, i often see psychology like especially these days a lot of young people are taking psychology in, in bachelors like mm -hmm. and but how do we bridge the gap it means you're studying psychology like even say from the professor perspective or like say now you're doing mm -hmm. counseling as practical sessions also so how is the way to say study psychology or practice psychology in a setup say either an academic setup or a therapy setup and actually living psychology in your everyday life so like in mm -hmm. india i can say like from my own experience of people i see around there is not so stark difference between say personal and professional because again we are dealing with human right. beings here we do have professional boundaries mm -hmm. but when it comes to your own experience so like i'm a psychologist in a setup at home i'm like this one person who has no idea what what's going on in my life mm -hmm. so how do you see that is it this difference very stark in your own experience yeah. in your own so what are your thoughts on that yeah i felt like for me i would sleep breathe live uh, eat psychology <laughs> i mean not to say that psychology is my life um i know that psychology is just a part of my life but for me because psychology deals with directly with human behavior and self to me integrating it as a part of myself was very important i did not want to so integrating it as a applying it to myself was very important again there i felt like there was a separation that i saw in identities as a professional and as a person especially in america is there although i have also noticed that in a lot a lot of people do that in india too is that you know in a therapeutic space they like understand and an outside of the therapeutic space they are like rude and mean and just put you down that has been an experience that i have also had with a lot of professionals for me i felt like being a psychologist and being empathetic you know they go hand in hand however you can be a very skilled psychologist and not be a, like not you know want to apply that a very different person as a in, as an individual and a very skilled psychologist and you can do very well with your clients also i'm not saying that that's not okay but for me it's like it becomes even better if you are that wonderful genuine person who even as a person in real life so for me the first thing about learning psychology was change within me um going inwards rather than just being like okay this is a professional set of skills i don't think that i'm a skilled laborer just being like i'm not doing customer service you know like hey sir how how can i help you and just saying things that another person would like i think psychology was a journey for me mm. and that definitely i feel helps me because clients can feel that i think a lot of therapy is about connection that they feel for some clients they don't have the privilege of that connection at all outside and 
And I felt like that from the feedback that I got from my clients, we have this anonymous survey. I learned that people really appreciated that sort of connection and genuineness, which I felt comes from this me not separating myself as a, like, I'm not a person in therapy. Be like, hey, I understand you. And then outside of therapy with my family, like I'm seeing them with sticks or something. <laughs> so I think that, it, but it, I think it more of it is, I don't know if it's cultural. You might be a better person to say that. But I feel like it's more of a personal choice of whether you want to be more aware of yourself and go inwards. But I think it's so important, as a, especially in the counseling field, because um, the number of mental health issues, including suicide rates in psychologists, is so high. It's among the highest in any profession. So I think looking inwards and taking care of yourself is also very important, rather than just being skilled and out there. I mean, I think you're better. What do you think? Do you think? Have you seen more people like separate their professional identities from their personal self, with especially in psychology, or do you feel like it's more integrated here? See, I also feel that uh, psychology is often taken as a profession, mm -hmm. and just because of our own conditioning, we have that profession, or like how I was, I was previously saying, action that my profession is different from who I am, mm -hmm. and of course, again, there are merits to it. It's not that if I'm, say, in a therapy setting. I will not have a personal connection with the client, but I'll be connected on a more human level. Yeah. But if I don't have that sense of understanding in my own personal experience, if I'm too identified with my actions, then I will cross that uh, line without even awareness. And that is why I think structure is so important and why West has taken to structure so much because we are not aware of that line within us. Mm -hmm. Because I often confuse of who I am with what I do, so I need a mechanical and outside structure to tell me, no, no, you are not your action mm -hmm. and include, say, a legal issue to it or an ethical issue to it to kind of create a fear sense of because fear is essentially that sense of separation. Mm -hmm. So a fear from the outside will help me to create that boundary. Mm -hmm. But if you look at from, say, the more Indian perspective or the Indian cultural perspective, it's and if I'm working on myself, like how you said, for psychology for you was a journey. So if I'm realizing that I'm working on myself, I realize who I am in that deepest sense, or at least I'm working towards that. Then when I go say in a setup like this, when I'm trying to help people, I'm not in that space of I am helping you. Right. Help is coming through me. So that little change in perspective opens up a lot. Mm -hmm. So then I'm not sitting here that you are looking at me as an identity of say I'm a psychologist and I'm there to help you. And it's my, yes, it's my duty to help you. But am I being a little, say, egoistic about it or identity oriented? Oh, I'm a psychologist. I help people. Or uh, I'm somebody who's uh, working in this field because I want to be there for people. And it's a part of my exploration. Yeah. So extending your journey to that helping space, but not your identity to that helping space. I think mm. that gives you a connection, but not dependence. And that is that thin line because often uh, I've seen few of the counseling psychologists also, like when I interact with them in the way, that though we are taught, like when you're taught in the say in your universities, that you have to not make them dependent or you have to create that independent sense. But say a client who stops coming to me, there's a sense that, oh, did I do something wrong? Or did I did the change this? Because I don't have that enough identity establishment or enough connection with my own self that I'm looking for that sense of assurance mm -hmm. from the outside. And it's a very tricky business, especially in this field, because we are dealing with human beings. If I'm creating a product or if I'm doing any other business, that might have some space. Mm -hmm. But if I'm trying to say, if a vulnerable person is coming to me, and knowingly, knowingly I'm not saying that a psychologist will knowingly do it. But because end of the day, psychologist is also a human being. So if I have certain lags, I will not know if I'm hooking my sense of identity to the other person's vulnerability. And that is something very <clears throat> tricky and one needs to be very, very aware of. And that is why if you look at counseling, say from the Indian perspective or say psychology from the Indian perspective, the fundamental thing which Indian perspective talks about is a consciousness based view and not say, say the physicalist view that you are not just the physical person. The physical person is of course, say the play or uh, the tool with which you are executing. So it's very really like that tool in which there's a certain sense of self which helps you execute. So it's more than about talking about the application of tool. It's more about say the composition of the tools. 
so if i'm say if you are talking in the psychology or say the counseling language mm -hmm. if i'm looking at counselor as a tool then what our education system gives us is how to use that tool how to use that tool how to use the tool so there are a lot of do's and don'ts about the usage of the tool mm -hmm. like how i say say the functionality of the tool but often we miss about the composition of the tool and if you look at any logical understanding if you take any tool if you know how it is made you can put it to a much better use than if you have borrowed a tool and you just have a limited understanding of say uh, like how we get those guidelines with any instruction manual so any tool you purchase you like okay how do you operate it then you op operate it but if you are creating a tool or if you are becoming aware of learning how to make a tool then you will not need the instruction manual then it's very instinctive and very intuitive to you so that whole field of working on yourself in a much more uh, deeper and a higher perspective that is i feel is much more required and that also requires time and space mm -hmm. so creating a form say a structure out of your experience or taking form as a base and going to your experience this makes a lot of difference and that is the shift like usually if you look at uh, today even in not just counseling but say the positive psychology uh, stream has come up so far in the last few years we have started talking about say positivity happiness health well being all of those things but still we are limiting it to the outside they say mm -hmm. you have like this whole obsession with happiness mm -hmm. is just about that sorrow is not given enough importance mm -hmm. so we are still dividing we are not and if you look at from say the indian perspective we are saying both happiness and sorrow are an experience because of certain stimulus in the environment so even if you want to look at from say the behavioral perspective it's a stimulus response association but i want to categorize it to be happy because i have to attach my identity to who oh, i am a happy person yeah but i am saying that i am a person who is having an experience so if the stimulus is creating something different in me which is not happy i feel sad if it's creating something good i feel happy both are an experience outside of me yeah so that labeling starts very early which we have to like really that unlearning needs to be done mm -hmm. and that uh like another very brief uh thing is that when i said that indian psychology is more of consciousness and it itself is a whole topic so we will not go into like the idea of consciousness or what but just becoming very loosely translated as aware of your existence and take that awareness of existence into your expression in the world so that existence expression bridging will help you become a better person and if you're a psychologist or a counselor become a better counselor and that is the process so it's like choosing say consciousness over conditioning in an everyday basis we are predominantly conditioned to be a certain way like we study conditioning in psychology in a conditioned way yeah. so that's the paradox which we deal with yeah so how to like bring that awareness mm -hmm. and take it as not an immediate uh, actionables in that sense yeah. but respecting the process of unfolding and taking like really becoming a psychologist is really embarking on a lifelong journey mm -hmm. so if it that spirit of say students take up psychology of yes i have that sense of i want to understand myself i want to understand self, uh, others so there's a relationship of individual and collective and more focus on the intention than the action mm -hmm. and the constant bridging of intention and action gives you a wider perspective i think uh, that's where i feel and i think that's where we can just have what you think and if you have any more questions or kind of bring it all together yeah i think that's a great point um yeah to conclude uh, i loved that you spoke about identity and like i said self awareness um, in acceptance and commitment therapy they say very beautifully is not the same as self evaluation and your identity being contingent on success or yeah self esteem is like you know um is a very nice psychologist christine that says she she says that you know self esteem and self compassion the difference between the two is self esteem is contingent on success but a self compassion has this common element of people so um separating your identity who am i embarking on that journey and i feel like psychology has helped me do that and psychology is such a wonderful field where you can actually take all of that knowledge and actually start applying it on yourself not to not not to say self diagnosis or something like that in psm but understanding what is self awareness what is identity and going beyond that and once you are able to understand that exactly for me me as a person comes first and psychologist is i don't know on what number uh, that's not predominantly what my identity is 
again but there is like this power distance that we have where automatically and it's you know like destructive obedience experiments have taught us that we might start feeling because we are on the therapist chair that we are superior or oh that i understand human behavior and like i know what you're going through kind of a thing um which is pretty problematic but again the deeper you go within yourself you start realizing you start becoming more humble and for me personally i feel like i feel truly um blessed that i have this opportunity to learn from the experiences of my clients because clients humble you down you know sometimes you feel like wow i have so much you know um it's very easy to feel like that if you're on a position and that is pretty much in dialogue right now in psychology is how to dissolve that sort of a distance power distance but you learn from clients that they are just individual beings going through so much and they have and especially when given that space for facilitating um they can do so much and they teach you a lot so again um that identity we need to but i feel like the more you get into education the more it humbles you because you realize that wow there's so much out there that you don't that you don't know and you're not aware of and again with happiness being an end goal again is that problematic so um structure is definitely helping us know what to do and keeping things in control because if we didn't have a structure we would just unethically practice uh, but at the same time we need to be aware that it's restrictive and it helps it stops from you know it doesn't help us go out of the box and bring in something creative um and like you said indian perspective has so much to offer like mindfulness is one thing from the east i would say but yeah that has brought so much out there and in indian psychotherapy again we it's conversational um we we don't have as strong boundaries because clients need to know you as a therapist otherwise they'll be like why should i tell you anything about myself very common for my clients to ask me hey like especially when i'm working with like older women they're like are you married why are you trying to do that how old are you what is what is your job like what is you know do your parents allow you to work and that's amazing i wanted to work but i never what got the opportunity to study it's just very common i think and there's that human aspect that is still that i felt was still here which was something one of my seniors reflected on especially when i got into one place where i work um my assistantship is with the international writing program so where there the writers were so intimate and talking in a personal level and that's when he said that wow it's like because psychology from a profession ethics and all of these things have become so much that sometimes instead of doing what's good you want to do what's right so that we're not sued um so we need to understand what's that difference we need to keep boundaries we need to be ethical but at the same time i think that human connection can come when your self awareness when you have a consciousness when you go in words and then you are a psychologist and that's a client you start dissolving that sort of stigma and you start dissolving that sort of label mm. of psychologist and client is also labeled right so yeah. i think that builds a to me i think that builds a beautiful relationship and that's something that indian perspective can offer also to us yeah i mean no uh... yes that's what no it's not about uh, like how i said labeling the label so even if you will have the label it will not bother you because you are much more aware of what lies behind the label and i think for us to discuss indian psychology we can just go on and on so maybe some other time we'll get together and speak more in detail about how but thank you so much for your time and sharing with us your experience thank you so much i'm just uh, it was a privilege and again just the last thing is that we are just as therapists what i feel is our facilitators yeah. we are not change makers or we are not the x factor that changed the client and made the world a better i mean we are just here to facilitate that process and i think remembering that is so important thank you no yeah. thank you yes. Thank you so much Aditi for some great conversation and it was just great to go back and see the whole conversation so this was really nice thank you yeah, likewise 
in case uh, anybody from the audience has any question for Janvi or any thoughts from the conversation. Yes, somebody is unmuted. Would you like to speak? Oh yes, please. Uh, my camera is unfortunately it's so is it's in non-working shape, and my query is actually from the conversation what I just listened. Possibly uh, this, as far as this consciousness is, I think is it is rather than uh, it goes to cognitive psychology, cognitive science, and in cognitive science these days there has been a huge. I mean, if we speak about this David Chalmers and afterwards, and it is a huge field of area and where is cognitive neuroscience is there computational neuroscience. So my query is, is there a psychological definition of consciousness apart from philosophy and spiritualism in psychology that is that we could say namely acceptable Uh, yes, so the question, the immediate answer will be that there are a lot of psychologists who are writing and working on the official definition, like how we were talking about everybody needs structure. But uh, what you spoke about, the uh, cognitive aspect, that is a small aspect of consciousness required in the functionality of human beings, that is being studied. So the consciousness which is studied from the cognitive perspective is a small part of functionality and seeing how it is. So that is the labeling aspect and that is the functionality aspect. And if you look at it from the Indian perspective, consciousness is the base on it which everything is created. So it is like this and everything which is happening is happening in consciousness through consciousness. And whatever, and whoever comes in and takes whatever their understanding is. So it's like an ocean, whoever wants whatever picks up, makes their own definition and works through it. So that is where we are in the field currently. Would you like to speak something on that? Yes, I think Aditi has uh, put it extremely well. Uh, different uh, fields of study have looked at uh, consciousness in different ways. Uh, modern science also has looked at it, but then uh, it tends to uh, consider matter to be primary and consciousness to be an emergent property of uh, what goes on in the uh, neuronal circuits in the brain. In philosophy, in psych especially spiritual philosophy and in Indian psychology, our perspective is just the opposite. Consciousness, as Aditi said, is primary. And uh, matter is secondary. Matter, that is the brain, is only a channelizer of that consciousness, not the generator of the consciousness. And uh, what appears as the consciousness of an individual is generalizing only a certain limited fraction of that universal consciousness. And that is how we get uh, consciousness of different individuals. We also get consciousness of the animal different from that of a human being, or for that matter, consciousness of dead matter different from the consciousness of a living being. So everything is actually uh, started as consciousness and has manifested as matter in such a way that it is able to channelize that aspect of consciousness, uh, which would be uh, useful for that particular state of existence, for that particular living being, for that living being to survive. And I think here in America still there, there's a huge debate about the difference between the mind and the brain and consciousness, which comes out of the mind. But then, you know, neuropsychologists and cognitive neuroscientists are still learning um, more about the brain because when you're thinking about something, when there is this consciousness, this concept of mind, there is st it's still hard to locate it to a part, particular part of the brain or to even know how that whole process works. So a little work is now happening in terms of memory, thoughts, uh, but I think we're still a long way to go to properly defined consciousness and um, you know I think it's just phenomenal that there have been people who've described it in philosophy but scientists are still working towards um, trying to find that that out uh, 
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I wonder if some, you know, it, it's just very fascinating because now it's like a lot of research around the prefrontal cortex and how that might be involved in um, planning, decision making. And it's fascinating. Maybe a few years from now, we'll be able to know. But it's just, I, w I know for sure that there are a number of scientists working in that field and in that area. And it's just a very fascinating debate. So it would be great to have that. It's a question that's been on my mind for a while and it would be great to also have like a more scientific basis to it um, as as long as we start learning more about the brain. But it's so recent. Brain studies and everything have been so recent because of um, the new technology. So I think we should be able to get there in some years. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. I, I think uh, this, and actually, I, I don't think it's uh, very recent because uh, so far I am aware of in 1990s from uh, this Christopher Koch uh, and uh, Creek, Christo I mean, Francis Creek and Christopher Koch. And uh, Creek was actually Nobel laureate. And he introduced a concept that is neural correlative consciousness. And based on that, yeah, you are rightly said that there have been loads of work are going on. And from computational neuroscience point of view, from uh, this cognitive neuroscience point of view, and there have been many theories put into place on theory of consciousness. And out of all this, and uh, very interestingly, there have been some Indian theories also put in place. Some recent, uh, the scholars, they have put uh, recently, I think 2021, yogic theory, uh, theory of consciousness, then, uh, uh, then something like that. And, uh, but above all, from uh, this, this scientific paradigm, I think, Two, two theoretical uh, uh, concepts are going on round, and one is integrated information theory, another is global workspace theory. And of course, uh, the Indian perspective, what I think Dr. Bijlani and Dr. Paul just spoken uh, just uh, beforehand, I think that perspective is still untouched. And of course, uh, uh, in, uh, in I think 2014, another this uh, this English uh, neuro uh, this cosmologist Roger Penrose put forward one theory that is uh, when the wave function collapses then it produces consciousness in the brain and uh, that was uh, and one of the reviewer in I think we can go through that in LCBS Science Detect that journal is there and Deepak Chopra was also commented on that that it is uh, consciousness is uh, I mean, uh, only privilege. And uh, I think my point is, uh, yeah, that's uh, the search is going on, but again, there are level of consciousness. I don't know when and how it will be uh, uh, picked up, but uh, yeah, that's a very much current state of study. Yeah. Yeah, just uh, while you sharing this, there are just two points that came to me. And uh, in that sense, when you talked about uh, scientific research, you know, uh, there is this term which I had heard of in one of our uh, sessions that scientists versus sage. Like when we look at the ancient scriptures and how this uh, how the scriptures came into existence and whatever we study, that was also an experiment. The only difference is that those people were actually going within and exploring and coming up with ideas because those ideas are more in their own experience, so they could vouch for it and they didn't need any evidence as such an external evidence. But when you speak about the scientific understanding today, it's we want something external, we want something tangible, we want to open it to you. And it's kind of from a distance. It's like I am somebody who is studying something. So I also feel there's some sense of shift of responsibility, like if we try to understand the theory of responsibility, where it is, and where we are in that chain of responsibility in discovering something. And if we look at consciousness from say, the Indian perspective and just start living from a certain space and get to that point from where it all started. So that division will just drop and we will have a theory which is not based on an experiment which is external, but based on an experiment which is internal. And more and more people when they say, 
take this stuff that take this responsibility, we will have a theory. So it's like going in a different direction. You experience and then create a theory. More and more people, and that is how in the Indian psychology we have come up with the idea of one person research. That you take up a topic and you live with that topic. There are certain things which come up with that topic, and how far can you go within? And then you make a theory out of it in terms of just verbalizing your experience. Like, uh, if we all have read scriptures, any form of scripture, there's a sense of eternal limit. We are not saying that, like how in journal we date journal, no, 2020s journal, 90s journal, because it, the temporal component comes in the structure, but there's always an eternal component in the scriptures. Journals don't have the eternal component, but scriptures do have an eternal component because the sense of responsibility is rooted in a much wider context. So, this is just one thought which I wanted to share and see because that is the only way if you really want to experience that. Whole idea of conscious living from that sense. So, just that thought came in, so I thought I'll just talk for it about it. That's something I that think that is know. similar to the em empiricists and rationalists. So, uh, empiricists and rationalists who are, you know, thinking about either experiment, like you said, their personal experiences or outside of yourself. It's a very interesting perspective. Uh, well, I think uh, if we, uh, some scientists, they do believe that universe may be conscious. I mean, uh, it's not exactly that what we know from science point of view, that is all accepted because uh, certain things from science also, uh, that is, we know that uh, that is unexplained. And some people in cosmology, they are also believing that universe is conscious. I mean, they put forward one recent example that some stars, when in 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 the galaxy, when they orbit, some party, same type of star, they uh, they behave differently. And probably there is a theory hypothesis. I won't say theory that probably there is some volition, and for which they differ. I mean, they behave differently. So. Uh, yeah, that's uh, 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 the consciousness uh, is uh, not uh, exactly, uh, I mean, uh, limited. I mean, it, the research is also going on and uh, yeah, at different scientific level, obviously, in quantum mechanics level also. And if we see that uh, the Schrodinger cat equation, that, uh, and, uh, that consciousness uh, query was raised, I think, 50 or 60 years back. So something is not known and it, it doesn't disprove anything. I mean, maybe in the future it will be known. And, and again, if I rightly uh, recollect that Roger Penrose, he, uh, there are some papers where he said that uh, maybe some, something fundamentally we are devoid of to include into the computational background of physics and understanding of all the things. So, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, consciousness, yeah, that's uh, from Indian perspective, yeah, that's very, very perfect. And, uh, but maybe, don't know in future why it will lead to probably someday it may be discovered also. We don't know. Janvi, uh, I think I'll end with a question to you. Uh, you and Aditi had a very enlightening discussion. But one thing which uh, I found was didn't find enough prominence was uh, the lacuna that you experienced in your uh, studies of psycho studies in psychology in India and probably continue to experience in the U.S. Uh, because uh, uh, that's the lacuna that Aditi experienced when she finished her doctorate in psychology in India, and uh, you, with uh, a pretty good understanding of the Gita, might have also seen that there's something missing there. Uh, how do you think, what was that lacuna and how do you think it uh, restricts uh, the field of psychology, uh, how it makes it uh, uh, or not uh, sort of as complete as it could otherwise be? Yeah, I think that's a great uh, question. And I'm still processing and thinking about it as, as to what was missing, what is that gap which can still be filled. Um, I'm, I think, uh, one thing that, like I said, was that humanity as aspect, cause it's very hard to like, for example, in the Gita, I thought Gita itself is like a therapeutic session cause it's 
Lord Krishna in conversation with Arjun and they're talking about so to me that like that was the first counselor I was exposed to of how he goes through the whole process of that conversation but I think that there's still that very human aspect of it I have lots of questions around I mean there are lots of gap one includes that uh, human behavior cannot be generalized and a lot of research that has been done in psychology is done in America uh, I think an American and on American population, which is only 5% of the population of the world, there is so much more perspective. There is, I think like Aditi said, um, reflecting inward, going within. Um, I think psychology is in like in a space where it's, it cannot, you know, it's trying to, it's on the way of becoming like, a, now it's under the STEM course. So like an established science, which can, have experiments but how would you do that because every human being is not like a chemical which you can control everything else for every human being is that is different so I feel that um, that gap is to like Aditi said again going within self-awareness um, and also knowing that every human every culture a lot of different people in this world are very different so a lot of research that we have like when I went in an ethics class and some questions that were asked, the whole class would think in one direction. And I felt like I was thinking in a different way because my lived experiences, my my understanding of ethics, morality, all of these are also so very highly influenced with culture. For example, one question that we were asked was in that space was, um, and this was based on a real real case, uh, case study, which was a you know, there's a client who has been contemplating suicide, has attempted suicide a number of times, and they're more than 21 years old. And uh, would you tell their parents, even if the child is saying no, that I don't want my parents to know that I'm contemplating suicide, would you still go and tell the parents? And almost everybody's answer was like, no, we wouldn't. And my answer was like, I definitely would I'll inform the parents. And then in reality, the student ended up completing suicide. And everybody was like and then and then that the university the professor at the university ended up getting sued for it so the u.s legal system thought that it was they should have informed the parents whereas the ethics ethical code in psychology uh expected that you don't tell the parents i think so that this is one example of a gap is that not just because it's like based on the ethical code based out of one country it is not universal there is so much awareness there's so much literature out there one paper i wrote last year in my uh in one of my assignments was about um how i used literature poetry and bhagavad gita and how i use that to inform my therapy and therapeutic approach why did i choose my therapeutic approach and how i use art literature including indian spirituality to work through that and my professor was very happy with the paper because that was something that they had never seen before. They were like, oh my God, this never works. But I was just saying that in India, the concept of psychotherapy is very different because a lot of that you also get through songs, music, Kabir's Doha's, or a lot of the literature that is already available out there. So I think psychology can expand beyond just the field of psychology to include spirituality, literature, um, history, and a lot of other things, which I think is still like a gap in psycho that's that's the gap that i personally experienced and think that's something that i want to work towards yeah that was uh, a very enlightening answer it has been nice seeing you uh, two months after you made your visit to india uh, yeah. in new delhi we had a rather gray day rainy day and now it's late in the evening i think there over there it looks like a bright and sunny day i can yeah. see i think a lot of sunshine uh, yeah entering through your window it feels very good even if the window is shut the sunshine still crosses through that it's so bright yeah okay, thank you if we don't have any more questions then we can close this and um, maybe with a minute of silence and once again thank you Jandi. i enjoyed the conversation and we're recording it and also today this interaction was really, really meaningful so thank you and I hope to see you sometime soon again. So we just end with a minute of silence and thank you everyone for joining.